So in the last chapter, chapter three, what we mostly did was we looked at the ways that cells can make ATP to meet their ATP demands. And in this chapter, chapter four, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the ways that cells get molecules and atoms in and out of their plasma membrane. This is what's referred to as cell transport. So I'm not going to review the entire plasma membrane. Um, if you need that, go back to chapter two. The videos discuss the entire plasma membrane and its structure. All I want to do is remind you, of, first of all, what the plasma membrane is, right? It's, it's the wall or barrier of every single one of our cells that um, keeps generally what's inside inside and what's outside outside. Okay? And the way that it accomplishes that is the plasma membrane has a core of fatty acid tails. Right? The core of every plasma membrane of every cell is made up of a whole bunch of fatty acid tails. And, and what are those fatty acid tails made up of? Hydrocarbons. And what are those hydrocarbons? Nonpolar. So every cell in the body has a plasma membrane. And the core of that plasma membrane is made up of nonpolar hydrocarbons. Now, what does that do? Generally speaking, because the core of all of our plasma membranes um, are made up of nonpolar hydrocarbons that keeps anything with a charge from being able to come in or go out. Anything in the interstitial fluid, the fluid that's right outside of our cells, that's charged, meaning is either polar or ionic, right? An ion is going to have a very difficult time getting in, right? Because it's charged and the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar. So the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar and it's going to reject um really pretty much anything that's charged so those molecules and atoms in the interstitial fluid that are either polar or ionic they're really not going to be able to come in and the same thing is true for the intracellular fluid or the cytosol in the intracellular fluid or the cytosol you've got plenty of molecules and atoms that are either polar or ionic right they're charged so they're not going to be able to get out how could they they're charged and the core of the plasma membrane is not, right? It's nonpolar. So it's going to reject those molecules and atoms that are charged and it's going to keep them inside. Well, that's what this chapter is about. We know that molecules and atoms that are charged need to be able to come into our cells and go out of our cells sometimes, right? And by sometimes, I really mean a lot. So this whole chapter revolves cell transport. It revolves around trying to understand how these molecules, mostly these molecules that are charged, how do they get in and how do they get out of our plasma membranes? Now, as you're going to see pretty much immediately, cell transport doesn't just focus on molecules and atoms that are charged. Okay? There, there are molecules and atoms that are not charged that also travel through um, our plasma membrane. They do it very easily, actually, as you're about to see. So cell transport as a whole is just the whole discussion of how any particular molecule or atom moves through the plasma membrane. Anything that can move through the plasma membrane is part of chapter four, right? Cell transport. But what I would say is the primary focus of it is understanding how these charged molecules and atoms, which wouldn't logically be able to get through the core of the plasma membrane because it's nonpolar, um, the chapter focuses on mostly how they would be able to accomplish this, how they would be able to get in and out. What does the cell do in, in order to be able to get these molecules through the plasma membrane? Just to give you an idea of where we're headed, uh, most of the time, in order to get these molecules and atoms that are charged through the plasma membrane, whether we're going in or we're going out, what the cell uses within its plasma membrane are these things called integral proteins. 
We've talked about these a little bit in chapter two, but these integral proteins um, oftentimes serve as, you know, um, channels or pores um, in order for these charged molecules and atoms to be able to get in or go out. You're going to see a lot of that uh, in this chapter. So when we talk about transport, cellular transport one more time is the way that cells get molecules and atoms potentially in and out um, of their plasma membrane. When we talk about transport, there are generally two categories. The first category is what's referred to as passive transport. Okay? There's passive transport, and the other type of transport is what's called active transport. Now, what we're going to focus on first uh, is passive transport, and then later on, uh, we'll talk about active transport, but we're going to focus on passive transport here. So, what is passive transport, first of all? For something to be passive transport, you need a couple things. You actually need uh, two criteria. All passive transport um, are going to have these two criteria. First of all, you need a diffusion gradient. So, what does that mean? You need a high concentration of molecules on one side, and you need a low concentration on the other, right? So there's a diffusion gradient. Where are the molecules going to want to move? They're going to want to move from a high to a low concentration, right? They're going to want to follow, they're going to want to follow their diffusion gradient. They're going to want to move from high to low. That's the first thing that you always need with passive transport. You need a diffusion gradient. You need molecules wanting to move from a high to a low concentration. Criteria number one. Criteria number two, what's the second thing that you need? The molecules are gonna to have to move from this high to low concentration um, without, needing any, without needing any energy. So they're gonna move from high to low, a high concentration to a low concentration. They're gonna move down their diffusion gradient um, and there's going to be no energy requirement. That is the second criteria of passive transport. Whenever you have, well, let's say it this way, whenever both of these criteria are met, you have what's known as passive transport. Molecules wanna move down their diffusion gradient. They're gonna move from high to low, and they're not going to need any energy in order to do so. You have those criteria, those two criteria, and you have passive transport. Now, there are many different types of passive transport as are listed here. Right? So there's different types of passive transport. There's different categories of passive transport, but all of them are going to meet this criteria. Right? Molecules are gonna to wanna to move down their diffusion gradient, move from high to low, and there's not going to be any energy that's required in order for them to do so. Please keep those two criteria in mind as we go through the different types of passive transport. The first category of passive transport is what's referred to as simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is a type of passive transport. That means molecules or atoms, in this case it's, well, it's really always going to be molecules um, for the most part. Uh, what this means in simple diffusion is molecules are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration, and there's going to be no energy requirement. Okay? That's what happens in simple diffusion. So the point I'm trying to make here is, first of all, this is going to be a type of passive transport, right? because molecules move from high to low without energy. But what specifically makes it simple diffusion? What makes it simple diffusion is the molecules move from high to low without energy, but they don't need any integral protein to travel through the plasma membrane. Okay, that is what makes something in this category of simple diffusion. It's when the molecules move from high to low without energy and they don't need an integral protein, any sort of transport protein in the plasma membrane in order to be able to do this. And what we need to understand is why. Why do these molecules that, that can move through simple diffusion not need an integral protein? And the explanation most of the time 
as to why certain molecules can travel through simple diffusion, move through the plasma membrane without an integral protein. It's because of the fact that they are nonpolar. Okay. Um, there are some exceptions to this rule, but most of the time, molecules that can travel through simple diffusion are nonpolar. Now let's start thinking of some nonpolar molecules. Well, fatty acids are nonpolar, for example. They're largely nonpolar, quite nonpolar. Um, steroids are nonpolar, for example. I mean, steroids are made from cholesterol, which is a lipid and is mostly nonpolar, and thus the steroids that are made from cholesterol are mostly nonpolar. Okay. Some other ones. Carbon dioxide, the gas, is very nonpolar. Uh, it's a carbon atom bound to two oxygen atoms. They share electrons very, very nicely. Um, and the molecule is incredibly symmetrical and uh, it is thus pretty nonpolar. One of the most nonpolar molecules on Earth is oxygen. Okay. O2, atmospheric oxygen, two oxygen atoms bound together. They create uh, this molecule is incredibly nonpolar. The oxygen atoms are both equally electronegative and share electrons pretty much perfectly. And you get very nice, you get a very nice distribution. This would be O2 right here, right? Two oxygen atoms bound together. You get a kind of a perfect sharing of electrons between the two oxygen atoms, and thus you end up with a very, very nonpolar molecule. Okay. So I'm just trying to give you some examples of, of molecules that tend to be uh, what are referred to as nonpolar. CO2, atmospheric oxygen, fatty acid tails, okay, steroids. These are all pretty nonpolar molecules. And the fact that these molecules are nonpolar allows them to travel through what's called simple diffusion. And why? Let's just pick one rather than going through all of them. Okay. Oxygen. Oxygen tends to be higher outside of our cells than it is inside of our cells. At least that's the, the way that we want it to be. And we'll explain that later on in the semester, okay. why that would be the case. Oxygen tends to be higher outside than it is inside. Okay. Oxygen, additionally, does not need um, any energy in order to be able to get in. Okay. So oxygen wants to move from high to low, and it doesn't need any energy in order to do so. So immediately you can say, well, this is going to be in the category of passive transport. High to low without energy. Great. But what about this type of passive transport makes this simple diffusion? This is simple diffusion because oxygen is nonpolar and it's not going to need an integral protein in order to be able to get in. Why? Because the core of the plasma membrane itself is nonpolar. Right? The core of the plasma membrane is made up of fatty acid tails, which are all hydrocarbons. So the whole core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar. If oxygen is nonpolar, is the core of the plasma membrane going to reject oxygen? And by the way, we're talking about atmospheric oxygen here, O2. Um, is, is the core of the plasma membrane, which is nonpolar, going to reject atmospheric oxygen, which is nonpolar? Of course, the answer to that, to the, of course, the answer to that is no. Right. So what that means is that atmospheric oxygen can just rip right through the core of the plasma membrane because atmospheric oxygen is nonpolar and the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar. So the core of the plasma membrane isn't going to reject oxygen. It can just go right through it. This is going to be true for most nonpolar molecules. Let's give you another quick another example and then move on. Okay. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, as you're going to see, and this should be, I think, fairly clear why this is the case, Carbon dioxide tends to be, one second, I get my pin working here. Carbon dioxide tends to be 
uh, what is happening here? There we go. CO2 tends to be higher inside of our cells than it is outside of our cells. That should make sense because our cells produce carbon dioxide through metabolism. Turning pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and running acetyl-CoA around the Krebs cycle, we produce lots of CO2 when that happens. So uh, there's lots, there, there's more CO2 inside of our cells than there is outside of our cells. So first of all, there's a diffusion gradient, right? CO2 wants to go from a high to a low concentration, high inside, low outside. You're not going to need any energy in order for CO2 to be able to do this. It's going to move from high to low without energy, and thus this movement is passive. Okay, so this is a type of passive transport. Now, why does this fall into the category of simple diffusion, which is, again, a type of passive transport? The reason is, is because carbon dioxide doesn't need anti carbon dioxide doesn't need any integral protein in order to be able to leave. It can just rip right through the core of the plasma membrane. Why? Because carbon dioxide is nonpolar and the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar, so CO2 won't be rejected by the core of the plasma membrane and it can just go right through it. So there you have the first category of passive transport simple diffusion. With simple diffusion, molecules will always move from high to low without energy, and they won't require any sort of transport protein, integral protein, to get through the plasma membrane. And it's usually, there are exceptions to this rule, but it's usually because the molecule is nonpolar, and you know this already, as is the core of the plasma membrane. So moving on to another type of passive transport. This one is what's called diffusion through channels. Diffusion through channels is another type of passive transport. So let's be clear, this is passive transport. So you're gonna need molecules or atoms to be high on one side and low on the other. And there's not gonna need to be any energy in order for the molecules or atoms to move down their diffusion gradients. So they move from high to low without energy, and thus this is passive transport. Now, if in order for these molecules or atoms to come in, they need to travel through a channel or a pore, which is a type of integral protein, by the way, what you're looking at here are integral proteins that are called channels or pores. Um, if this molecule or atom needs to travel through a channel or pore, in order to get in or out, now it's referred to as diffusion through channels. So before we get into the details of this, I hope you can make a distinction between this and the last type of passive transport that we went through. This is still passive transport, right? Because the molecules or atoms are moving from high to low without energy. But since they're moving through an integral protein, one that's called a channel or a pore, in order to get in or go out if this were the, the opposite direction, um, now it's called diffusion through channels. Now this will only become, this part I'm about to mention here will only become relevant later on in the semester, but sometimes these channels or pores are just open all the time and sometimes they're closed and then they can be popped open by a stimulus. You know, whether they're open all the time or they're closed sometimes and pop open, that's really not important for the moment, but will become important once, you know, it's a couple weeks away when we start talking about neurons and, plasma and, and resting membrane potentials and that sort of thing. Um, the difference will become important. But, but for now, um, just one of those things that you kind of stow away in the back of your brain and, and, and come back to it later on in the semester. Let's give an actual example. That's obviously, that's what we need to do. So, sodium ions. Sodium ions tend to be high outside of our cell and low inside of our cells. Okay. So because of their diffusion gradient, they want to come in. They want to go from high outside to low inside. They don't need any energy to do so. Right. So this is passive transport. But in order for those sodium ions to come in, they need to travel through a channel or a pore, as it's called. When I say channel or pore, I, I mean the same thing. Um, so these sodium ions have to travel through this channel or pore. The, these channels or pores are actually specific 
to sodium ions. You're missing some context here, which will become more and more obvious later on as this semester progresses, like I talked about with metabolism a million times, just stick with me. Um, just realize there the, in, in the plasma membranes of our cells, there are these channels or pores that are actually specific to sodium ions. No other ion, sometimes uh, this is the case, that can actually travel through these channels or pores other than sodium ions. First of all, why? Well, because a sodium ion is an ion, right? It is lacking one electron that it lost to something else. Um, and thus it has more protons and electrons, so it actually has a positive charge to it. And what's the core of the plasma membrane? The core of the plasma membrane is made up of hydrocarbons, which are nonpolar. So the core of the plasma membrane, which is nonpolar, is going to reject sodium ions from being able to come in because the sodium ions are charged. So sodium ions really have no chance of getting into our cells just naturally. They couldn't come in through simple diffusion. It'd be impossible because the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar hydrocarbons, and it's going to reject sodium ions, which have a positive charge. So in order for the sodium ions to come in, they need a channel or a pore that they can get through. And that's exactly what's accomplished here. These channels or pores actually serve as a passageway for these sodium ions to come in because otherwise the sodium ions wouldn't be able to get in. They absolutely need these pores or channels in order to be able to enter. And it's because they're charged. You're going to find out that diffusion through channels is how most ions get in and out of our cells. Okay. There's an, let's, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because without context, it's very hard to see the relevance of it. There will be context, just not at the moment. Uh, pick another ion, potassium ions. Potassium ions tend to be high inside of our cells and low outside of our cells. Okay. So they want to move from high inside to low outside. And they can do this without any energy, so it's a type of passive transport. But potassium ions are positive ions, just like sodium ions. So they can't get through the core of the plasma membrane, which is nonpolar. So how do you get potassium ions out of the cell? Well, you need little channels or pores in order for the potassium ions to leave. And that's exactly what you find in the cells of your body. There are actually potassium channels or potassium pores. They're, they're, they're integral proteins um, that are embedded into the plasma membrane of your cells that allows for these potassium ions to be able to leave. And this is what's called diffusion through channels. You're going to see this with the vast majority of ions that can come in and out of your cells. They, they leave through this process that's called diffusion through channels, which is a type of passive transport. Now there are molecules that do this too, but the molecules that do this, you can imagine, are charged in some way. Either the molecules are polar or they're an, they're an ionic molecule. Um, if you want to get that charged molecule or atom out or into the cell, you're going to need a pore or a channel um, in order for it to do so. So logically, diffusion through channels is a type of passive transport. And it's the type of passive transport that charged molecules and atoms use to get in and out of our cells largely. Right In diffusion through channels, there's always going to be these integral proteins, these channels that serve as a passageway for some molecular atom that's charged in order to be able to get into or out of the cell. But remember, this is always a type of passive transport. So that molecular atom needs to be moving from high to low without needing any energy. So let's do a real world example of diffusion through channels. And we'll do this by looking at the, the passive transport of water. Okay. Yeah, this process is called osmosis. Osmosis works through diffusion through channels. 
right? Osmosis is, is the passive transport of water and you need these channels or pores in order for water to be able to flow. So let's go ahead um, and, and discuss how this works. So here is the plasma membrane, a, a plasma membrane. On one side, there's water. And on the other side, there's water. Which side is the extracellular and intracellular fluid doesn't matter for this conversation right now. You already know the first part of this answer, I think. Water cannot naturally move through the plasma membrane. Right. Let's pretend that the water on the left side wants to get over into the right side. Why would that happen? Because the water concentration would theoretically be higher on the left side than it is on the right side. Right. So water wants to move from left to right. right. And it can do so without energy. Right. So this would be a type of passive transport. However, the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar. And what's water? You know that water is incredibly polar. Right has a positive and negative side due to the uneven distribution of electrons. So water can't get through the core of the plasma membrane. So water would like to move from high to low through the core of the plasma membrane, but it can't. So you can imagine, what do you think you need in order for water to be able to move? And the answer is you need pores or channels for water. And that's exactly what's embedded into the plasma membrane of every cell in your body. There are these things called aquaporins. Aquaporins just means water pore. There are these little pores or channels that are embedded into the plasma membrane of our cells. And they're channels or pores for water, right? And what that does is it allows for water to be able to move from a high to a low concentration. So you know that water on the left side wants to move over to the right side where the concentration is lower. Right? So as long as there's a channel or a pore in the plasma membrane for water, then water can do so. And that's exactly what happens with osmosis. The water moves from a high to a low concentration from left to right without energy and water uses a pore or a channel or a pore or a channel to actually be able to move through the plasma membrane. What you're seeing here is diffusion through channels. It's a type of passive transport. Water is moving from a high to a low concentration without energy, and the water molecule is using a channel or a pore in order to be able to do it. This is how a lot of charged molecules and atoms passively get through our plasma membranes through this process that is diffusion through channels. Now, there's a lot more to understand about osmosis than what I just went through. And that's what we're gonna do here, is we're gonna look closer at what actually causes osmosis to occur. Nothing I said was inaccurate. Like, Water moves from a high to a low concentration um, without energy through our cells, and it travels through pores in order to be able to do so, which is a type of diffusion through channels. But what actually dictates the water concentration uh, is a whole different conversation, and that's what we want to do here. Okay? So what we want to understand, first of all, is this term osmolarity. Osmolarity is looking at the solute concentration within a solution. So first of all, we need to understand what the solute is. Solute, by definition, is everything within a fluid that isn't water, okay? So anything that's within a fluid that isn't water is solute. Sodium, potassium, glucose, chloride. I mean, anything that's within a solution that's not water is solute by definition. Okay. Now, the higher the solute concentration, 
I would normally ask if we were in person, what effect do you think that that has on the water concentration? Like if I continuously increase the solute concentration of this solution, right? I just drive up the solute concentration like crazy. What's gonna to happen to the water concentration? The water concentration is gonna fall. The higher the solute concentration is, the lower the water concentration will be, right? And on the opposite end of that, what if I were to start removing lots of this solute? Okay. If I start taking away a whole bunch of solute, what's gonna to happen to the water concentration? The water concentration will rise. So the lower the solute concentration, the higher the water concentration. I think this is fairly logical. Okay. Anytime that you increase the amount of solute in a solution, proportionally, you're decreasing the amount of water. Okay. And this is actually what's important for determining osmosis. Okay. And I'm going to explain this with relationship to the term osmolarity in a second here. Imagine you've got this plasma membrane here. This plasma membrane has got a whole bunch of aquaporins embedded within it, channels or pores for water. Okay, You've got water on the left side and you've got water on the right side. To figure out which direction the water is actually going to go, you need to figure out what side has the higher water concentration? You already know that water is going to move from a high to a low concentration, right? But you don't know right now which side has a higher water concentration unless I were just to blatantly tell you like I did a minute ago. To really understand which side has the higher water concentration, you have to figure out which side has the higher and lower solute concentration, okay? So let's just do this. Every dot that I'm drawing is solute. Let's pretend that all that solute is, I don't know, sodium, okay? Just sodium, nothing else. Let's just leave it at that. Now, in reality, it would be many different things other than just sodium, but for the sake of simplicity, let's just say all the solute is sodium. All right. Which side has the higher solute concentration? Obviously the right side. The left side has a lower solute concentration. So now what you can start doing is you can just start, you know, in your head, rather than just doing this by the book, which we'll talk about in a second, but you can just in your head say, well, let's just make up some numbers. Let's say on the right side that it's 70% water and 30% solute. Okay? Now, if we look on the left side, what would we say? Well, if I looked at that, I'd say 95% water and 5% solute. Okay, well now you have figured out which side has the higher water concentration, which side has the lower water concentration, right? Where's the water concentration higher? The water concentration is clearly higher on the left side and the water concentration is lower on the right side. So what direction is water gonna move? Water is gonna move from a high to a low concentration. So, what direction is water going to go? Water is going to move from the left to the right side. This is osmosis. You have to figure out the solute concentration of the two sides to figure out the direction that water is going to travel. Right? You can clearly look at the left side and you can see that the solute concentration is lower, so the water concentration must be higher. And on the right side, the solute concentration is higher, so the water concentration must be lower. And now you know water is gonna move from the high concentration on the left to the low concentration on the right. And you can figure out logically what's going to occur as well through equilibrium here, right? Uh, as the water moves from the left to the right, what's going to happen, first of all, to the water and solute concentration on the left? As the water leaves, the water concentration will fall and the solute concentration will rise, you know, proportionally. And on the right side, what's going to happen? As the right side gains water, the water concentration will rise 
okay, the water concentration will rise and the solute concentration proportionally will fall because the right side's gaining all this water. And eventually you'll get to an equilibrium where the water and solute concentrations are the same on the left and the right side. This is how you actually figure out osmosis. Osmosis, one more time, is the diffusion of water. It's the movement of water from a high to a low concentration. But if you want to actually figure out osmosis, which direction water is going to go through osmosis, you need to figure out where's the higher water concentration and where's the lower water concentration, and that will always give you the answer as to which direction water is going to flow. And one more time, I mean, what are you looking at here? You're looking at diffusion through channels, right? Water is moving through a type of passive transport. Water is moving from the left side to the right side, right? It's moving from a high to a low concentration. No energy is being used in order to do this. So it's a type of passive transport. And the water molecules are going through these channels or pores. So osmosis falls into the category of diffusion through channels. So the thing that tends to throw people off is the solute concentration. They look at the solute concentration, let's say in my last example, they look at the solute concentration on the right. And they say, rightfully, the solute concentration is very high on the right and it's low on the left. So the solute wants to move from the right to the left. They wouldn't be wrong for thinking that because the solute does want to move from the right to the left, um, at least assuming the solute is all the same. Like in my example, I said it's all sodium ions. Okay. Let's pretend all of this is sodium. Sodium definitely wants to move from the right to the left, right? But the problem is really one of two things. Either there's no sodium pores that are embedded into the plasma membrane, so sodium really would have no ability to get from the right to the left at all, or there might be a few. Let's pretend that there are a few. Okay, but cells don't have very many um, sodium pores, sodium channels, for sodium to move through uh, diffusion through channels. There's the, the most abundant transport protein in every single plasma membrane um, of every cell in your body are these aquaporins, these, these um, these pores for water. Okay, there's very few for sodium. So sodium definitely wants to move from the right to the left. But what I can tell you is in really all circumstances, not very much sodium can actually move from the right to the left. And any sodium that does move from the right to the left pretty much immediately gets kicked back over to the right. So the amount of sodium on the right side is really going to stay exactly the same. And the amount of sodium on the left side is going to stay exactly the same. What won't stay the same is water, right? Because water has so many, and I'm drawing too many of these pores. Let's draw it in, in blue. The black ones are, one second. The black ones are for uh, sodium and the blue ones are for water, right? I'm just trying to draw a ton of water pores. Okay, so there's millions of these aquaporins embedded into this plasma membrane. So water can move in through the membrane like incredibly freely because of the number of these pores. Sodium, on the other hand, like, yeah, some sodium can move from the right to the left. But again, like I said, even the little bit of sodium that accomplishes this gets kicked right back over to the right through mechanisms we'll talk about later on in the semester anyways. So the amount of sodium on the right side is really not going to change. So really the solute concentration on the right side will stay identical. But what can change is the water concentration because right now we know that water is much higher on the left than it is on the right. So because of the number of these pores, water is really going to get pulled over to the right side through osmosis. So don't let these diagrams throw you off. Because when you look at the diagram, you're going to see lots of dots that imply solute on one side and less dots that imply solute on the other side. And you, you would look at that and immediately think, well, you know, the solute wants to move from the high concentration to the low concentration which again you wouldn't be wrong to think but that solute that you're looking at is really incapable of moving 
from high to low because there aren't um, you know, transport proteins in the membrane, very many of them at minimum, in order for that solute to be able to do so. So what's really going to move is water. And the purpose of that solute being depicted in the image is for you to be able to see which side is the water concentration higher and which side is it lower, and that'll tell you which direction water is gonna go. So now that we've talked about the basics of osmosis, we can get into the more technical components of osmosis. So osmosis is exactly what we just went through, like the water moving from high to a low concentration through aquaporins due to differences in solute on the left and right side. Okay. But when you actually do this in a lab setting or you read about this in a, uh, some journal article or something, the way that the solute concentration is discussed is not going to be like as a percentage like I did. Okay, the, the real way to do this is you look at the solute concentration um, measured in, in, a, in a true unit. Okay. So solute concentration of a solution um, is oftentimes measured in what's called milliosmoles. Okay. So where does that come from? Okay. So one mole of solute equals what's called one osmole or one osmolar. Okay. Now, that's a bit too large of a unit for the human body for you know, the, the solute concentration of, let's say, our intra or extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid most of the time. Um, so what's used instead is milliosmoles. Okay. One milliosmole equals one one thousandth of an osmole. That is really the way that we oftentimes measure solute concentration, is in milliosmoles, which is looking at how many thousandths of an osmol uh, exists within the solution? That's how solute is, is oftentimes measured. And to add more confusion to that, the number of milliosmoles within a solution is, ca is called also, most importantly, its osmolarity. That's actually the important part of this, is to realize the solute concentration in technical terms, the solute concentration within a solution in the human body is really measured in milliosmoles. And the number of, of milliosmoles within that solution is referred to as its osmolarity. And that I need to do some more explaining about. So let's do that. This whole thing you've seen before, right? That is a plasma membrane. And embedded into that plasma membrane are aquaporins. Okay. And then you can look at the left and right side, right? There's water on the left side and there's water on the right side. Now, if you just did what we did um, at the beginning of this lecture and, and relating to osmosis, it, it'd be easy to figure out which direction water is going to go, right? You look at the left side, clearly the solute concentration is lower, so the water concentration is higher. You look at the right side, the solute concentration is higher, the water concentration is lower. So water is going to move from a high concentration on the left to a low concentration on the right through diffusion through channels, osmosis. Now, if you start looking at this on a much more technical level, then what you need to do is you can't talk about the solute concentration as a percentage. You need to talk about the solute concentration in terms of milliosmoles. So on the left side, the solute concentration is actually 300 milliosmoles. And on the right side, the solute concentration is 500 milliosmoles. Now, that's great because you can use that term in the exact same way that you did with the percentage, but now you're doing it more accurately. So if the solute concentration on the left side is 300 milliosmoles and on the right side, it's 500 milliosmoles, then still the solute concentration is lower on the left. So the water concentration must be higher. And the solute concentration is higher on the right. So the water concentration must be lower. What direction is water gonna move? Water is gonna move from a high concentration on the left to a low concentration on the right.
Now for this very important term that I was talking about, which is osmolarity. Osmolarity deals with the solute concentration. Okay. So if the solute concentration is lower on the left, then the osmolarity of the solution on the left is lower because osmolarity and the concentration of solute in a solution are really the same thing. So on the left, lower solute concentration, thus lower osmolarity. On the right, higher solute concentration, thus higher osmolarity. The higher the osmolarity, the greater the tendency for that solution to pull water towards it. Again, these terms are highly technical, but they also make sense, and you need to know them in order to make sense of physiology, because the term gets thrown around all the time. So, let's talk about what this means. On the right side, on the right side, the osmolarity is higher. What all that means is the solute concentration is higher. Okay? So the solute concentration and thus the osmolarity on the right side is higher. And on the left side, the osmolarity is lower because the solute concentration is lower. So what's going to happen? The solution with the higher osmolarity or solute concentration is going to pull water towards it. And now comes another incredibly important term in physiology, which is osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure and osmolarity are really the same thing. Osmotic pressure indicates the tendency of a fluid or a solution to pull water towards it. Which side has a higher osmotic pressure? Clearly, the right side has a much higher osmotic pressure than the left side. Osmotic, you can really say this either way, right? You could say that the right side has a higher osmolarity. That would imply that the right side has a higher tendency to pull water towards it. You could also say that the right side has a higher osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure and osmolarity really are the same thing, and you can more or less use the terms interchangeably. It's just the tendency uh, of a solution to pull water towards it. Any time that the solute concentration rises, let's say in a solution, you add solute to the solution, its osmolarity and thus its, uh, its osmotic pressure will increase, and it will have a greater tendency to pull water towards it through osmosis because technically its water concentration is decreasing. And this brings us to some more technical terms, isoosmotic, hyperosmotic, and hypoosmotic. And this all deals, when we're talking in the human body, you, whether the solution is isoosmotic, hyperosmotic, or hypoosmotic, it's, it's always dealing with the solution that exists outside of the cell. Okay, so you have a cell. Let's pretend that the cell has uh, a solute concentration of 300 milliosmoles. That would mean that its osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles, its osmotic pressure is 300 milliosmoles. Okay, now let's pretend that the fluid outside of the cell also has a solute concentration of 300 milliosmoles. The solution that's outside of the cell right now would be referred to as isoosmotic. It has the exact same solute concentration and thus osmolarity or osmotic pressure as the fluid inside of the cell. So water is not going to go in either direction. Water is not going to go outside of the cell through osmosis. Water is not going to go inside of the cell through osmosis. Now let's drive the interstitial fluid. Um, solute concentration up to 500 milliosmoles. We have now created what's called a hyperosmotic solution. 
by driving the solute concentration up within the interstitial fluid. We have driven up its osmolarity and thus its osmotic pressure, really the same thing. So what's going to happen now, right? The water concentration is clearly higher inside of the cell and clearly lower outside of the cell, right? Because the solute concentration inside of the cell is lower and thus the water concentration must be higher. The solute concentration outside of the cell is higher and thus the water concentration must be lower. So where is water going to go? It's going to want to move from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. The cell is going to shrink. The point of this is to say, what do hyperosmotic solutions do? Hyperosmotic solutions have a tendency to pull water towards them. Right? right now, we've made the interstitial fluid, the fluid outside of the cell, hyperosmotic. Right? We've, we've made it have a higher osmolarity or osmotic pressure than the fluid inside of the cell. So what it's going to do is it's going to pull water towards it. That's what hyperosmotic solutions do. And again, we usually talk about the, this, this, these terms relating to the interstitial fluid, the fluid outside of our cells. If we make the interstitial fluid hyperosmotic, then water is going to leave the cell. Hyperosmotic solutions have a high osmolarity or osmotic pressure, a tendency to pull water towards them. And now let's do this. Let's make the interstitial fluid have a solute concentration of 150 milliosmoles. Okay. If the interstitial fluid now has a uh, solute concentration of 150 milliosmoles, we have now made it hypoosmotic. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, its solute concentration is now less than the fluid inside of the cell. The interstitial fluid solute concentration is less than the solute concentration of the cytosol, the intracellular fluid. So now what does that mean for water concentrations? Well, if the solute concentration is lower in the interstitial fluid, then the water concentration is going to be higher. And if the solute concentration inside of the cell is higher, then the water concentration must be lower. Okay. This is what happens if we make the interstitial fluid hypoosmotic. Now the solute concentration of the interstitial fluid is lower than the solute concentration inside of the cell. And thus the water concentration outside of the cell is greater than the water concentration inside of the cell. So where's water going to go? Water is going to go into the cell and it's going to cause the cell to swell. If you put the cell into a hypoosmotic solution, the cell will, sw will swell. Hypoosmotic solutions have a tendency to lose water, right? Remember, hyperosmotic solutions have a tendency to pull water towards them. Hypoosmotic solutions lose water, right? Water leaves hypoosmotic solutions into cells because the water concentration in a hypoosmotic solution is, is greater than inside of the cell. So water will move from a high to a low concentration of osmosis into the cell. Another way of saying this is that hypoosmotic solutions have a low osmolarity or a low osmotic pressure, and thus they tend to lose water. These are three terms that you're going to want to know, and I can promise you, uh, technically, when you talk about these three terms, they always relate to the fluid outside of the cell. So when I talk about them, I'll always be discussing them in terms of the interstitial fluid, the fluid outside of our cells. To give you an example, let's say I told you, you have a, a, a cell. It has a solute concentration of 300 milliosmol. You take that cell and you dunk it into a solution, and that solution has a solute concentration of 300 milliosmol. And now you've taken the cell and you've put the cell into this solution. I might ask, this solution that you've dunked the cell in, what could we say about this solution? Well, what we could say about it is it's isoosmotic, right? This solution that we just put the cell in 
has the exact same solute concentration, osmolarity, osmotic pressure, whatever term you want to use, as the cell that's currently within it. And then I might ask, well, what direction would water go in this circumstance? It wouldn't go either direction because they have the exact same solute concentrations, the exact same osmolarities, like the, nothing's gonna happen. Now, what I could ask is, what if you were to take, um, you were to add solute to this solution and you were to make this solution uh, now go up to, uh, let's say, 400 milliosmoles. Okay, now the solution that the cell is within has a solute concentration of 400 milliosmoles. What have we done to the solution? What have we made it? And hopefully you'd be able to say, well, we've made the solution hyperosmotic. Right? We've driven up the solute concentration of the solution so that it's greater than the solute concentration of the fluid inside of the cell. In terms of the solution, we've driven up the solution's osmolarity or its osmotic pressure. And then I might ask, well, what direction uh, would we expect water to go? We would expect water uh, to move from the cell out into the hyperosmotic solution, right? Because hi what do hyperosmotic solutions do? They tend to pull water towards them. So this would cause the cell to shrink. You're going to want to be able to apply these terms to these sort of circumstances. So I don't love talking about this because I think it confuses things more than it helps to some degree, but you do see the, these two terms and I, I would like you to know the difference between the two uh, because at some point along the line, I, I think it would help. Um, certainly if you take more advanced courses. So the term osmolarity and the term tonicity. Okay, so we've talked about osmolarity. Osmolarity um, is the amount of solute within a solution. We could also refer to that as kind of osmotic pressure. Now, tonicity really is the same thing as osmolarity, uh, but it only deals with um, solute that under no circumstance can cross the plasma membrane. So with osmolarity, all you're doing is you're looking at all of the solute within a solution. Whether that solute is in any way capable of crossing the plasma membrane or not at some point uh, is irrelevant to osmolarity. Osmolarity is just simply the total amount of solute within a solution. So again, uh, whatever it is, three, four, 500 milliosmoles. Now, tonicity, on the other hand, it is the solute within a solution Right, so it's just like osmolarity in that sense. It's the solute within a solution. But when you talk about tonicity, it's the solute within a solution, and it's the type of solute that under no circumstances can it ever cross the plasma membrane. So for example, sodium ions. Sodium ions would contribute to osmolarity, as we've discussed now multiple times. But sodium ions would not contribute to tonicity because sodium ions technically have pores in the plasma membrane that they are able to cross occasionally. There are sodium pores in most plasma membranes of every cell in your body. So since sodium ions can actually cross the plasma membrane at times, sodium ions would not actually technically contribute to tonicity. Most things that contribute to, to like tonicity are charged proteins, um, and they don't have any ability to actually cross the plasma membrane of a cell. This can become very important when you're creating like solutions to inject into somebody's body uh, or to give somebody fluids when they're dehydrated. Discussing the differences between osmolarity and tonicity can play a role, definitely. But just for the sake of understanding um, osmosis, in understanding how osmolarity and osmotic pressure influence the movement of water, whether it be into or out of the cell, then understanding tonicity and its differences with osmolarity is really not all that important. All I would ask that you know is that tonicity is really the same as the same as osmolarity, right? The, sol the amount of solute within a solution. But the difference is that solute, when you're referencing tonicity, that solute in no way 
has the ability, the, the only solute that contributes to tonicity is the solute that in no way can ever cross the plasma membrane. So you can use the terms isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, just like you can use the terms isoosmotic, hypoosmotic, and hyperosmotic. But the specific type of solute that you're talking about when you're discussing isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic is a type of solute that, again, cannot cross the membrane. The differences between these two terms can become quite important, especially like in advanced chemistry and physiology lab settings. Uh, but for the sake of this course, all I would ask is that you know the definitional difference between the two and needing to apply the difference between these two is, is not something that we um, are going to do to any meaningful degree um, in this course and certainly not something you need to worry about for, a lecture, for like a lecture exam. What you want to know for the lecture exam is what we talked about in the previous slide, which is differentiating between isoosmotic, hypoosmotic, and hyperosmotic. As can often happen in, in science courses, uh, you can lose complete track of what we've been talking about. Uh, we went on quite a, a somewhat of a tangent there, a necessary one, um, and you may no longer even remember what all of this was even about, this lecture. What we're focusing on are different types of passive transport, right? How the, the, the type of transport that involves molecules moving from a high to a low concentration through the plasma membrane without using any energy. And the two types that we now have discussed are what are called simple diffusion. That was the first one. Molecules move from high to low uh, without energy, and they don't need an integral protein in order to cross the plasma membrane, most of the time because they're nonpolar. Um, and the one that we just got done discussing, which may seem like we did a lot more than just discuss it, but we really didn't, um, was diffusion through channels or diffusion through pores. Molecules move from a high to a low concentration without energy, and they need pores or channels in order to be able to get in, most of the time because they are in fact charged, right? Either polar or ionic. That huge um, <laughs> tangent we went on was ultimately about osmosis. Right? and what dictates osmosis, osmolarity or osmotic pressure. Um, but ultimately, osmosis itself, the whole process, is a type of diffusion through channel or diffusion through pores. Right? It's water moving from a high to a low concentration without energy through a uh, pore or a channel, an aquaporin. The reason that we kind of got a little bit away from strictly discussing the different types of passive transport is because we needed, we needed to explain a little bit more as to what actually dictates osmosis. And now we can finally get back to talking about the last type of passive transport. All right, so the last type of passive transport is what's called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport. So you're going to have molecules that move from a high concentration on one side to a low concentration on the other without any energy. Okay, so it's passive. But what makes it specifically facilitated diffusion? Facilitated diffusion is a lot like diffusion through channels. Actually, it's so similar that some textbooks actually don't differentiate between facilitated diffusion and diffusion through channels. The molecule or atom, most of the time it's a molecule, um, that is going to move from the high to the low concentration without energy is going to be charged, first of all. So it's not just naturally going to be able to get to the core of the plasma membrane, you know, like with simple diffusion. So what is it going to need in order to be able to get in? It's going to need a channel or a pore, you know, an integral protein. It's the shape and orientation of the integral protein that makes this facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, what you have is the integral protein is always going to be open facing one side and shut facing the other. So let's give an example. Glucose uh, gets into our cells through facilitated diffusion. What you're going to have is you're going to have glucose. It's going to be high on one side and it's going to be low on the other, meaning it's going to be high in the interstitial fluid and it's going to be low in the intracellular fluid. Great. Glucose, we know, is polar, right? It has hydroxyl groups, so it's charged. 
Okay, so glucose can't just get through the core of the plasma membrane, which is nonpolar. So glucose is going to need a transport protein in order to be able to get in. And the transport protein that brings glucose in is initially open facing the interstitial fluid and closed facing the uh, intracellular fluid. Then what happens is glucose comes in and docks inside of this integral protein. And then it changes its orientation so that it's closed facing the um, interstitial fluid and it's open facing the intracellular fluid. And that allows glucose, this monosaccharide, to come into the cell. Um, and then what happens is the pore or the channel, right, it, it, it reorientates itself. So again, it's closed facing the intracellular fluid and open facing the interstitial fluid. And that allows another molecule of glucose to come in and dock. And then it reorientates itself so that it's open facing the intracellular fluid and closed facing the interstitial fluid so that that molecule of glucose can come in. This is the only difference between facilitated diffusion and diffusion through channels or diffusion through pores. It's the shape of the integral protein and the way that it functions. In facilitated diffusion, the integral protein is, is constantly changing its orientation so that it's open towards one side and closed towards another. The, um, the pores or the channels that are used in the other one, diffusion through channels or diffusion through pores, they don't change their orientation like this. Sometimes they're shut entirely and then they pop open or they're just open the entire time, but they don't change their orientation so they're open on one side and closed towards the other. That just doesn't happen in diffusion through channels or diffusion through pores. Uh, that this, this particular you know, transport protein opening on one side and closing on another side is specific to facilitated diffusion. But other than that, Facilitated diffusion and diffusion through channels or pores, right? It's exactly, they're exactly the same. It's just the way that the transport protein, the integral protein operates is a little bit different between the two. So now you have seen the different types of passive transport. Okay. You've seen simple diffusion, you have seen diffusion through channels, and you've seen facilitated diffusion. All of these are types of passive transport. Passive transport is always when molecules move from high to low without energy. That's the broad category of passive transport. But then you have different types of passive transport. And we've talked about all three of them now, and you will want to know the differences between the types of passive transport. Of course, the one that we covered the most and thus you'll, the one you'll probably get the most questions about uh, is, is diffusion through channels, particularly osmosis. All right, in the next lecture, we'll move on to talking about this other type of transport called active transport.